Uh, we'd like to welcome you back to our Learning to Fly, the third episode where we get to explore the song of the universe together. The beautiful sounds and vibrations and harmonies and words that create music to our ears and open our hearts so that we can feel connected to the world around us and connect our bodies into this physical world knowing that we're not alone. Mm. So many ways for us to connect to the song of the universe, not only as we listen outside of us, and you may even hear in the background a couple of the beautiful bird life that we have around us singing their call, but also we want to introduce you to the idea and sense tonight that we have the song of the universe inside of us too. Yeah. And each piece of our internal reality, our internal environment, contributes to the orchestra, the symphony, the beautiful production that is this physical form of myself or the physical form that you're currently sitting in right now. And there are so many pieces to take into account with that. Mm -hmm. That is um, probably the greatest mystery that we seek to solve and yet um, struggle with the fact that it's unsolvable. It is known as the great mystery. Uh, what is the, uh, the consciousness, the intelligence, the force, the intent behind why anything exists? You know, why is it all here? Why are there stars and asteroids and moons and planets and humans and animals and plants and minerals and good food <laughs> yeah, you know, why is there water and air uh, you know all of that all those great mysteries that uh, many of us seek to try to interpret and understand uh, often leave us feeling very frustrated and the unanswerable nature of them uh, is what contributes to that frustration. We do, however, have uh, a very if, a very powerful teaching uh, called the 20 count uh, that helps us to at least give some names, mm -hmm. uh, a sense of understanding, a sense of uh, comprehension of what the forces are that contribute to the creation of everything. And uh, inside of these Twisted Hair teachings, we have this gift of the 20 count, mm -hmm. which gives us a direction to look at. You know? And words um, and concepts yeah. to be able to uh, connect to so that we can actually bring into communication some of those understandings and feelings and senses that are often beyond our ability to put into words. Right. Yes, it yeah. becomes a language that we can speak to one another about understanding these in intangible energies that create that are made up of the great mystery. And intangible energies is what we are really going to be talking about. Uh, the fundamental uh, premise of shamanism is that everything is energy. It's all made up of energy, and what these uh, twenty names are going to do is identify those different specific energies. Mm. If we can at least do that, it gives us um, it gives us a better idea of what the big picture is about. Not that we're going to get these uh, um, answer, definitive answers. In fact, that's part of the teaching of <laughs> yeah, the 20 counts. Exactly. Uh, the elders say that the 20 count can, cannot be taught to you. The 20 count truly is something that you need to take on as a responsibility to awaken inside of yourself. Mm. It becomes your, um, your action to make a connection to each one of these different energies uh, so that you can learn what they mean from them directly and also what they mean to you personally. So it becomes this journey back and forth. Yeah, I think it's a good time to take the money Lovely. So tonight we have a, a journey, a meditation, if you will. Uh, I'm going to guide you 
down into the depths of gentleness and personal power inside of you. As I awaken and introduce you to the words and the names and also the places on the medicine wheel of these energies, these powers, these songs, these instruments, these vibrations uh, sit. And so they all sit in different places and uh, they come together in, in many different ways. So uh, for a moment, you're going to just make yourself comfortable, get into a position where you're not going to need to move for a while. You may want to just grab a blanket or even some smudge if you have some available or something that helps to cleanse and clear the space. And so we're going to give you a few moments to get that ready while we uh, prepare the meditation. I invite you to step into the silence as we explore the energies and powers of the song of the universe. Take a few moments to make sure that you are comfortable. You may want to rest your hands loosely in your lap or by your sides. Gently close your eyes. Take a few slow deep breaths. Relax your body. Release any immediate tension that you may be holding in your body. Make sure that your body is comfortable. No muscle exertion is needed in the way that your body is positioned. Recognize that through the layers of the floor below your feet, you are upon Grandmother Earth's body and that she is cradling you at this time. Just breathe and relax into her arms. Now let your breath find its natural depth and rhythm. Bring all your awareness down to your feet, your calves, your knees, your left foot, your right foot. In a moment, at my suggestion, you're going to breathe into your feet, your calves and your knees. You're going to squeeze and tense all the muscles in this area and then relax them completely. Are you ready? Now breathe in. Squeeze all those muscles tight, tighter, tighter. Just hold it for a moment and then relax and release as you breathe out. Let your weight drop into the earth as your feet and your calves and your knees just drop away into the stillness. Now breathing into your hips, your thighs, pelvis, breathing in and squeezing tight, tighter, tightest, pausing for a moment in that action and releasing as you let your breath out and relax all the muscles in your body in your th thighs, your hips, your pelvis. Next, breathing that air into your torso, all the vital organs and systems that move and sit and live in close proximity to one another within this main body part. Breathe in, breathe in and squeeze, squeeze, squeeze your torso tight, tight, tight. Hold it for a few moments and release and relax and let go. And allow your torso, thighs, hips, pelvis, knees, ankles, feet, toes, just let them drop into the stillness with Grandmother Earth. Breathing now into your arms, your elbows, your shoulders, your hands and fingers, your neck, brain, skull, head, face, all these parts that carry tension, pain, restlessness that drains them. 
And in your own timing, breathing in to all these places, squeezing, squeezing, squeezing tight, tightly. Hold it for the moment and then release and relax and let your whole body drop down into the warmth. Take your time in this process of relaxation. Let all the parts of your body, including the tiniest of muscles around the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the jaw, just letting them all soften and melt down and away into the beautiful warmth, the cradle of Grandmother Earth's arms. Your whole body now totally relaxed, surrendered. Your heartbeat joins hers and your whole being simply sings in harmonic resonance with the 20 powers the 20 sacred energies of the universe, the 20 count Let your body awaken to this blueprint, to understanding the powers of the creation, the powers of the universe, and the powers within you. Mathematics is the language of the 20 count powers. Music is the heart of the 20 count. Science and philosophy are the mind of the 20 count. Magic and alchemy is the body of the 20 count. Universal life force energy is the soul of the 20 count. The powers of the universe are 20 variations on the same theme. The pulsating chi that flows through all living matter. We cannot learn the 20 count through others. We have to open up our interconnectedness and be willing to step into the interrelationship of all forms of all things. So let us look to the great mystery, the everything orchestra, the song of the universe and its 20 sections. This is the great wheel the universal medicine wheel of the 20 sacred powers. Each power has a sitting place on the wheel within the orchestra so that its vibration can contribute in a perfect harmonic way to all the songs and sounds that come from it and also within it, as well as those that go out from it in an ever-increasing circle of light. The first part of this song is both the first part and all parts contained within the whole. The first part is zero, the nothing that is the everything, the everything that is all things. It is the great mystery, the great spirit of this everything orchestra. We might say that this zero, this void, is the song that it is playing and singing. Within all sound there is light. Light is an energy which includes cycles as it manifests itself into the sacred 20 medicine wheel of sound. The first power is Grandfather Sun, he who sings his song of illumination and enlightenment from his sitting place in the east of the Great Medicine Wheel. Across from him in the west is his mate, the second power, Grandmother Earth. She sings the song of intuition and introspection and the chants 
of the mysteries of death and life, rebirth and movement. Hers is the song of beauty and change. To her right are her first children, the sacred plants and the sacred waters. These sit in the south. The plants are singing the songs of trust and innocence, the songs of the giveaway. The waters are singing the songs of carrying the myths of the joy of having pleasure within our emotions in everything that we do. Across from the plants and the waters sitting in the north, we find the sacred animals. They are the fourth power and the second children of the sun and the earth. The song they sing is one of balance and harmony, and they carry the sacred chant of wisdom and logic. This is the chant that is carried on the sacred winds, which blow fiercely through our minds like a hurricane, and its howl of awakening. Sometimes the winds blow gentle and softly and whisper to us of clarity. These powers of the four directions are dancing with the four elements, carrying the song into the south of the center of the circle, where we humans are sitting, playing our instruments and doing our dance of life song. Sometimes our instruments, our bodies, are out of tune and our song, our dance, our music, becomes disharmonious. So, we must turn and face the southeast, where the sixth power is sitting, and listen to the power of the ancestors' song. Their song is singing to us of the beauty of the concepts of self as a spirit, a soul, who can sing and play in harmony, if we will learn the Enlightenment chart and begin to sun dance. They teach us this sun dance in order that we might learn the song of self-acceptance, self-appreciation, self-pleasure, self-love. As they sing their songs and play their music, we begin to hear from the seventh power, which is playing in the southwest. This power can be difficult to hear. For its song comes from within us and yet is also outside of us. Here sits the power of the sacred dream and it sings to us the song of the beauty of symbol. It sings to us the song of beauty. It sings to us the chant of the memory circle. And if we hear this chant, we begin to awaken. We begin to realize the past, the present, and the future may appear to be different songs, but they are really just different lyrics within the same song. Hmm. To know all the words, lyrics, and melody of this song, we must turn to the northwest, to the eighth power, for this is the song of the circle of law. At first we may be confused, we must listen closely though. There appears to be more than one song coming from this place, and there are many sounds. It seems almost disharmonious, and so it pulls us to begin to listen more closely. We look at the instruments that are being played by this power of the Northwest, and we see that they are really rules and laws. The sounds that they make are those of the sacred image and law chants. Together, they create the rules and laws of our sacred images, or the circle of law chant. This really causes us to listen because we are beginning to hear the harmonics carried within the southeast, blending with those of the southwest. They are like whispers within the second circle of law chant. Now we are really beginning to awake. Cut. 
This really causes us to listen because we are beginning to hear the harmonics carried within the southeast, blending with those of the southwest. These are like whispers within the sound of the circle of law chant. Now we are really becoming awake and we begin to notice that we see the sound within the light and hear the light within the sound. Yes, confusing, but it seems to wake us up from the more common sleeping state. We begin to tune our instruments so that we can play in harmony with what we are experiencing. The longer we play, the more in tune we become. We begin to see and hear that within the circle of law chant is our book of life. And all the songs that we have ever sung, all the music that we have ever played, all the chants that will be our dream of the future song. This is our music that we play. We are playing and dancing almost in perfect harmony, but we're a bit off in our rhythm. We know this because we hear the sound and feel the percussion. We turn to look at this great power. We see that it is pure energy that is bringing this song. It is movement itself. It is the ninth power that is dancing and flowing with the rhythm of all the other sounds. Catching it. Tuning to it. Aligning to the great choreography. We see and know that this is movement. Change happens here. We begin to perceive that maybe the song is written here, designed from this place. This song sings to us of the northeast section of the great orchestra of the medicine wheel of life. And from this northeast, it seems as though the circle is complete, but then we really begin to awaken. And we feel drawn, pulled by a spinning, whirling sensation. It is as if the winds of the tornado were blowing us towards the north of the center of this great wheel, this great orchestra. The north of the center. The power is elusive. The sound is on a very high scale and comes from the tenth power. It is on such a high scale that the light within the sound seems beyond our ability to perceive. The sound within the light seems to be ringing inside our head, inside our own mind. For a brief moment, we are singing our song, playing our music, dancing our dance, and we fall into perfect rhythm and harmony. In this moment, we realize that this tenth power is the great measure the great intellect that lies within ourselves. It lies within every note, song, sound, light, presence and power within this great orchestra. We are conscious of it and yet unconscious to it. We seem to be part of it and yet not a part of it. We struggle to remain in harmony and not lose it for we know intuitively that it is here that all of the energies, all of the instruments, sounds and songs are collected. They are blended together in a collective and unified circle. We dance at a gateway. We see, hear, sense, feel the experience of this great sun dance. We realize that if we can dance through this gateway and ever greater song is being played on the other side. This song is coming from within the circle and from outside of the circle at one and the same time. There is a double energy that is vibrating back and forth from each of these powers of the wheel of life. The one to the many, the many to the one. The microcosm to the macrocosm and back to the microcosm. We look again to the east and we see and hear many voices, many instruments, many songs being played in harmony with Grandfather Sun's song. These are the Grandfather Stars, the 11th power. They are singing the song of inspiration and the chant of the Heokas. 
There are many songs here and each is a sacred teacher. The light coming from these songs begins to reveal to us our own illusions. We begin to see why it is so hard and yet so simple to sing this song of the 11th power. There are many songs in many dances in many lives, yet we had thought there was but one song. That was our feeling of separation. And so we turned to the west so that we might hear the song of the looking within circle. The chant that is coming from the twelfth power, the grandmother planets. There are also many songs and dances coming from this power, all of these speaking of the many lives of all our brothers and sisters throughout all the planets and worlds of this universe. There are, in fact, many great orchestras. They sing to us the grandmother songs of the power of woman, especially they sing the special song of everything is born of woman. We begin to spin and dance with this beauty. We seem to be playing faster now and more smoothly. We no longer separate the instruments from ourselves. We can no longer separate the sounds from the music. It is a part of us. And this now seems natural. Deep within our hearts we realize that the song and the dance have always been there and we sing for joy as we turn towards the south yet again. We begin to see and hear a sweet and gentle voice singing the beautiful lyrics of the heart of the plants. We realize that their song, spirit, energy, vibration, is singing to us the song of nature. This is the 13th power, our Earth Mother. Her song is beautiful, for it carries the light and the spirit of all the sacred plants straight into the fibers of our being. Her song travels up the light paths of the umbilical cord of life straight into our hearts. Hers is the beautiful song of the Blessed Beauty Way chant. Our hearts begin to soar like an eagle on the fleeting wings of time as we spin towards the north to become the dance within the wings of the 14th power. We see that this 14th power swims as the dolphin and carries us through the rivers of life, through the eons of time. This power flows into the great lake of memory and is Earth Father. He teaches us the dance of the snake so that we might be close to the ground and hear the song of the rock people. He teaches us to dance with the four-leggeds through the flowers and trees so that we can hear the songs of the plant people. This is the world of magic. We feel the medicine of the sacred chant called How to Fly as the Eagle. And we realize that this is indeed the sweet medicine chant. Within it are the songs of the spirits of all of our animal brothers and sisters upon this sacred planet. Again, we begin to dance for joy. We begin to see through the eyes and ears of all of our brother and sister humans. As we see through their eyes and hear through their ears, we realize that they are like mirrors to us. In fact, everything around us, every power within this orchestra is a mirror. Each reflects back to us our own inner light. This reflection is carried on the sacred winds of the songs of our soul. And we can see this great mirror reflected back to us from the east of center of the circle of life. Here in the east of center sits the 15th power, the souls of all humans. It sings the gathering together circle song and chants the sacred rainbow chant of the Sundance Way. It sings to us, little sister, 
little brother, the look within yourself song. See the beauty of all that is. Open your eyes and look around you and see the many mirrors and the many powers. Look into and through the eyes of even one brother or sister and you can see the whole universe. We can play all the songs now since we know all the music and can dance all the dances. Go beyond, they sing. Go beyond all that appears to be. This you can do by moving within the song of the southeast, the song of the 16th power. These are the enlightened souls and they sing a song and carry a light that is a great rainbow. They sing the chant called the chant of the many paths. They sing the chant called the one to the many and the many to the one chant. Their song is a powerful song. It says within it words like, you little brother, you little sister, you are the way, the light and the truth. Look within yourself and find the light. Know that truth can be found from anywhere on the wheel and that the only way is any way that leads to the center of the wheel. They begin to teach us how to find our way. They sing the chant called the way of honoring your brothers and sisters. They play the sound of all the ways will gather together within the rainbow circle dance. You must dream this way, they sing. You must awaken with the song of the 17th power of the Southwest. Here, the great Kachina powers, they are the dream teachers. They are chanting the dance your dream awake chant, the blessed beauty way chant the sacred medicine pipe chant, and the sacred sundance way chant. The 17th power of the southwest, the Kachina chant, is as infinite as the many stars within the great sky. All of these are the sacred chants of great power. They point the way to the dream of the 18th power of the northwest. They are singing the song called the Great Magic Chant as this 18th power is the keepers of the keys of the book of life, of all humans within everything. Their most sacred chant is the children's fire chant. This sings the song reminding us that nothing must be done to hurt the children. They sing gently to us that within all humans is a child. They sing the Become as a Child song and the Honor the Child Within song. As they sing, they point us to the Northeast where we see a light that speaks with the voice of thunder. You know that this must be the 19th power. The 19th power includes the great Hokshida Haze and they are singing the cosmic chant, the chant of total balance and harmony of all things within the everything. There is a flash of lightning and a clap of thunder. In an instant, that becomes infinity. You are imploded into the sound of the lightning and exploded into the light of the thunder. You soar through the gateway of infinity, flow through time, space and dimension and awaken as you fall into the west of the center of the circle. You have met the 20th power, the great mystery, the great spirit and you, we, all things have now become one with the everything. And as you feel awakened to these beautiful powers, this chant of the universe, the song, the words, the lyrics, the sound, the light, 
the language, the heart, the mind, the body, and the soul of the 20 counts. You awaken, ready to begin the journey back into your body, into your awakeness and full consciousness, bringing you back with the knowledge, the wisdom and the understanding of the 20 counts, of the song of the universe, of the song within you, the song from outside of you, the song that is you. And as you do, you step into a new dream, a deeper sense of being fully present in your body, clearer, stronger, and more empowered in the expression of yourself. And so you begin to hear my voice again. You begin to come back into your body. You begin to become aware of the light filtrating through your eyelids. And as you hear my voice counting you back into your body, you remind yourself of the numbers five, four, Three, two, one, and you will awaken. Five, you become aware of stretching into your body, wiggling your fingers and wiggling your toes, breathing and stretching your body as you step forward into four. Breathing, letting the light filter through your eyelids even more, stepping into three, hearing my voice even closer and becoming aware of the room around you and the sounds outside. Two, starting to wiggle and stretch and open and move your body until one, you open your eyes and find yourself fully awake, aware, alert, refreshed and rejuvenated and ready to tackle your next step. Aho. Now that you're back from your journey through the universe and touching those energies inside of you, uh, we thought we'd take some time and go through each one of these energies and have a brief discussion about each one of them and how we can experience them, how we can identify them, and how we can better come to understand uh, the way in which we explore this great mystery uh, through the 20 codes. The first thing to consider is that everything is duality, everything is paradox. Wherever there is light, there is also darkness. And as much as we seek to touch and feel Uh, to understand things and make them tangible, uh, the fact remains that the energy that makes something exist is intangible. So this, this concept of nothing that is everything and everything that is all things speaks about that very nature is that, um, even though we think we can touch something, it's only temporary, Mm. that everything uh, eventually dissolves into something else. It transforms. So what we think is something is only there for a short time until it becomes nothing. (laughs) And there's another way of looking at this great mystery as well, as the womb space and birthing place that holds infinite potential. Uh, The idea of uh, dipping into that energy and pulling different pieces of energy together in order to manifest and birth something into being. Mm. So that great womb space of grandmother earth of the universe, it's um, no sooner do we think that we've uh, understood the next uh, cycle or the next layer of it, then we realize that there's another layer beyond that to understand. And so that wind space is certainly that uh, dark, rich, fertile opportunity of creation of the everything that is all things. And it is from this great mystery that we step into 
that medicine wheel yet again, using the directions of the wheel to give us an understanding, we begin with the first power in the East, Grandfather Sun. And you'll see on the screen that there is what we call a sigil there that has a representation of Grandfather Sun. And the energy of Grandfather Sun is one that we all know very intimately. Without it, we probably wouldn't be around. And yet, we so often take these energies for granted. Mm. And <clears throat> one of the things that Grandfather Sun uh, teaches us is to focus the light on what we are doing, where our attention is. We are often, uh, we often go through life very blindly in reaction as opposed to paying attention to what we're really doing. And so if we use the sun as our metaphor, it's to shine the light on each moment, to look at it as clearly as we can and to even shine the light on those shadowy places that are a little scary. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course. <laughs> Grandfather Sun doesn't discriminate about where yeah. it is that he penetrates his light into us. <laughs> mm. The other thing about uh, the light is when we understand, it's like the light bulb goes on. Mm. So the willingness to look at something means we're willing to cast our sight on it, which we need light in order to be able to see. Mm. Right? And there's something quite pleasurable about seeing something like you didn't see it before, which is right. another energy that Grandfather Sun carries that we can connect to, mm. is the energy of pleasure and knowledge. Right. Mm. Yes. We jump across the medicine wheel to the west where we find Grandmother Earth. I love this little sigil of the uh, turtle. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling like we all live upon Grandmother Earth's back. Mm. Who knows, she, perhaps she is a turtle flying through space. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the uh, legends that mm. come from uh, indigenous uh, stories that speak about uh, grandmother Earth being a turtle flying through space, and we're all riding on her back. <laughs> and we are riding on her back. Uh, she is flying through space. As she spins on her axis and revolves around the sun, uh, and the sun is doing its own movement through our galaxy, mm -hmm. and our galaxy is doing its own movement through the universe which can be a little overwhelming mm. when you think about moving out towards that. So Grandmother Earth teaches us about the willingness to go within, to go within ourselves and to, uh, to start nurturing the places inside of us that hold and carry our intuition. Mm. Yes, uh, within her body, she possesses everything she needs to give love. Mm. And within our bodies, as we identified in Children's Planet, that we are, this body is a planet. So within our bodies, we possess everything we need to nurture ourselves, to care for our needs, uh, to uh, engage with life to the fullest of our uh, physical capabilities. Hmm. You know, the other thing Grandmother Earth is, uh, if anything, is she's physical. Right. right? Uh, we are on terra firma, <laughs> and it's solid, and it supports us, and upon it, we build our home, and it's the same thing about this home that we reside in, mm. uh, is the healthier it is, the better our quality of life. Mm. Mm. We move down to the south, where we find the sacred plants. The sacred plants teach us of trust and innocence. A seed pops open and expands and cracks itself through its shell and starts growing down into the earth and up towards Grandfather Sun. And so the elders tell us that the sacred plants were the firstborn of Grandfather Sun and Grandmother Earth's lovemaking. Hmm. And we know that from the plants, they give us our uh, nutrition, our nourishment, 
just think about the grasses and grains that bring us um, such sustenance and the fruits and flowers and even herbs for healing. Uh, sacred plants are truly givers of many different pieces of nourishment and healing and, um, and health and even joy and celebration. Just think about the beautiful giveaway of uh, a flower. Uh, we often pick flowers and put them into our homes to bring lightheartedness and joy into and, our lives. And beauty. And beauty, yeah. of course. The other thing um, that struck me as you were sharing about the plants is that trust and how a gardener will take a seed and push it down into the earth to ensure that it will uh, germinate and sprout into the plant that they desire to grow. But nature doesn't do that. <laughs> she drops these seeds or the plants drop these seeds on the earth. There's, there is no force driving them into the ground. There's only a trust, a trust that the Earth will receive that seed, nurture it, care for it, give it what it's needing, including uh, the light of the sun and the water and oxygen. Mm. And, and the minerals from the earth. Yeah, and that trust from the plant to know that it will reproduce itself without having to uh, insert much force or energy like we humans tend to do. And, and I think that's a beautiful metaphor to, uh, to take into account in our lives and pay attention to how we force, we try and force things to happen. Or uh, grow. Or um, grow before their time. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to accelerate things instead of trusting in the essence of what is growing, that it has its own time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we now look to the sacred animals up in the north of the medicine wheel. And for those of us who are animal lovers and who surround ourselves with animals in our home, we know how receptive animals can be to energy and to sound. Just think of the four leggeds with their feet upon the earth, feeling into the vibrations that we're often numbed out to. Uh, sacred animals, know how to live in balance and harmony in the world. An animal will not usually feast more than it needs to gluttonously on uh, a certain plant just because it tastes good. They move around and feed themselves and they contribute in, in equality to the, the natural balance of all things. And this is a significant lesson that we can learn from them as human beings. Mm -hmm. Another thing about animals is that they all know uh, naturally how to live with one another in this symbiotic relationship and how they govern each other's uh, growth. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if one species is uh, getting larger in population, that there's something else that will come to bring that back into balance. Mm. And there, it's not about having meetings or committees mm. and uh, passing laws mm -hmm. to make it happen. It's a, there's a natural intuition and in knowing that uh, things need to shift and change and there's no bad feelings about it either. Mm. You know? If all of a sudden the population of rabbits go skyrocketing then following behind is the population growth of say foxes and coyotes and whatever else feasts on rabbits depends which part of the world you're right. in <laughs> you know and then eventually there comes an equilibrium and uh even though the the predator's population is growing it can only be sustained for as long as there's enough food and then it finds its naturalness and there's no judgment about that. Mm. So I think one of the things to take into account from the animals is to accept life as it presents itself instead of having judgments and opinions about it. Mm. You know, how often do we have uh, 
our own point of view and we think it's the right one. And we're stuck there. Yes. Yeah. We move to south of center and this is where we find sacred humans. Now we always like to joke about this. This isn't where we find scared humans, although many of us do feel scared about the ways in which we don't connect to the world around us. And also most especially how it is challenging uh, to connect and communicate with our fellow humans. And of all the worlds and all the energies that we can understand on this planet that we live upon, humans are usually the ones who seem to be the most out of balance. That's because we're determiners of energy. So we do tend to make choices and decisions that impact not only ourselves, but also our environment. And so here in the 20 counts, this sacred human's power is the one that is teaching us how to find our hearts how to speak from our hearts, how to open our hearts and become vulnerable with one another. Just as the sacred humans were teaching us how to accept without judgments or comparison or attachments, this is what the sacred humans are teaching us that we can aspire to become. Mm. Um, another thing about the sacred humans is in our determination that you spoke about where we make choices, those choices have a far-reaching impact. Mm. And if we look at the impact we've had on this planet, on other species, on our environment, uh, it hasn't all been something to be proud of. Mm. And that's because of that disconnection we have from the rest of the world. When we have the power that we have as human beings, it's easy to abuse it we have the ability to alter the course of life. And that comes with a responsibility. Mm. And I feel that's the, the teaching here for us is to be accountable, to be responsible for every action we take and to always ask ourselves, is this of mutual welfare and benefit for myself, for life, and for others. And if the answers are yes to each of those three things, then do it. But if it's questionable or there are some no's in there, then I would, uh, I would say to stop and reconsider what you're doing. Mm. I'm also just noticing that uh, at five with sacred humans, uh, we have these other four powers standing below us that we can use to find that, uh, that health or that uh, effective way of making a choice and decision going forward. Absolutely. If we're willing to see what needs to be seen, not the things we want to see, if we can trust in Grandmother Earth and, as you were saying, just trust in the growth and development that we choose, if we welcome the energy of the sacred plants to trust, to, to question the choice that we're about to make, is it going to be nourishing and feeding the children of Grandmother Earth? And finding that balance and harmony of sacred humans, that brings us into this place of being the sacred being. Absolutely mm. true. The other thing to add to what you just said is that these are all visible, tangible um, representations that we can look at or you could say that they are in our visual reality. Right. Yeah. And it's so interesting how for as long as we have uh, known, when humans need some time out or some rest, some rejuvenation, they'll go and find a natural landscape to connect to, one where they can connect to those energies and find their balance again. Yeah. All right, so now we move to the southeast where we find spiritual ancestors. And the spiritual ancestors, there are uh, a few energies here that we speak about the spiritual ancestors. We speak about the Tililique, which are the little people, fairies and gnomes, sprouts, some of those energies that we perhaps used to play with and uh, see when we were children, but as we grow, we tend to disconnect from. To Sheila Hay, this is the energy of all our personal uh, spirit selves, all the, the lifetimes that we have had of power, of beauty, 
of being the sacred human. The Tungashila are our blood relations. These are our ancestors, perhaps no longer in physical form, uh, that we connect to through prayer and that we connect to through our blood. Uh, they are of our family bond that have come before us and even those that have yet to come. One of the beautiful things that I love about this teaching of spiritual ancestors is to acknowledge that whatever work we do as a sacred human on this planet in this lifetime, that we do it uh, with the intention of uh, bringing healing to the generations, the seven generations that have come before us and the seven generations that are yet to come. And this speaks to those spiritual ancestors. The Omatakwiasan, for all our relations, all those awakened selves. <laughs> What that's about is that we are all one family. Mm -hmm. There is no separation between uh, race, color, uh, religion. Uh, we are all of one family. We all come from the same source. And that is, for me, what uh, the spiritual ancestors are reminding us to always uh, feel that connection um, that, you know, when when someone that was close to us has passed on, um, it's often said, well, you know, they're still in your heart. Mm -hmm. And there is a truth to that. Once we get past the grief of the loss, that they're no longer physically here, there is still a presence of that person that can be felt. And that's one of the things to pay attention to through the spiritual ancestors is just because we can't see it, touch it, feel it, you know, or smell it or whatever, sensually, in the physical, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Mm. And those, those energies are present. They are around us, reminding us that there's more to life than what we have right in front of our nose, mm. where we can get very uh, focused on something and lose sight of the bigger picture of things. Mm. And the other teaching that I love about the spiritual ancestors is how it is that they teach us to love ourselves as unconditionally as we imagine they would love us. You know, there, is a, there is a very big uh, discrepancy between how we wish we can love ourselves and hold ourselves as sacred and beautiful, uh, as opposed to how we really do hold ourselves. And we have an inner dialogue going on in our heads that tends to separates us from that ability to love ourselves unconditionally as our ancestors would. Mm. Okay, let's move to the southwest of the wheel. This is where we find the sacred dream. And this is the process of life itself. It's the waking up every day and making choices and decisions about what it is that you're going to create in your day, in your dream. It's also connected into our desire to live. And oftentimes in this direction of the wheel, our sacred dream is hampered by ideas or concepts or even um, pieces that, uh, that we carry fear around. Well, if I do that, what would happen? Hmm. Mm -hmm. And that tends to hold us back from being present to the process of life and also receptive to opportunity. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the thing to consider here is that our reality is happening because of our choices. And so as you just spoke about, if we're willing to face our fears, we change our reality. Mm. If we run away from our fears, we create a reality that uh, keeps repeating itself. So if, if any of you out there listening to this, uh, including ourselves, mm -hmm. I always like to try and listen to myself as well, um, feel that life is constantly repeating itself, that there's a part of life that feels like a repetition, uh, to ask what is it that I'm unwilling to change or look at that needs to change so that my life can keep moving pro 
progressing mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, feeling like a, a mundane repetition of the same old, same old. Mm -hmm. So we really do have the power within ourselves to change what isn't working in our lives. Mm -hmm. I know that to be true because I feel like I'm living proof of the yeah. changes that I've made in my own sacred dream. I love the little sigil there. I know that it's an infinity symbol, but it also reminds me of binoculars mm. to continue looking into my darkness and cracking those things open. Mm. Okay, let's move to the northwest of the medicine wheel. And this is where we find the eight, the book of life. And the book of life is in some uh, teachings known as the Akashic Records. It is said that we carry a book of life that has all the experiences that we've ever experienced or ever will experience. It's the place where we find those patterns that we tend to get stuck in. You know, when, as you were saying, that life becomes repetitive and the same and it feels like we're stuck in a rut. It's because we're carrying out and living out these same patterns and we know that when we repeat a pattern, it becomes harder to break. Mm -hmm. And so the book of life is the place where we can look into our selves and our behaviors and our experiences. And we can start discerning what it is that we're ready to let go of. Mm -hmm. What are we ready to change? What are we ready to look at and choose to take a different path? Uh, I like that uh, expression about uh, we can walk around through life like we're an open book. Mm -hmm. Our patterns are visible. Mm -hmm. Our patterns are encoded inside of us. And what this um, book of life is teaching us to do is to cast our gaze upon those patterns as if we were looking into a book to recognize what is unproductive in my life, what is dysfunctional, what isn't working for me, and then to make those changes, as you said. But this, this particular energy uh, is about helping us identify what the pattern is so that, that we can then make a choice about it. Right. Yeah. We move to the northeast of the wheel, and this is where we find design and choreography of energy. And when we began the teaching, we were talking about the great mystery and we were sharing about how everything in our universe is energy. We take food in and food gets transformed into energy in order to help our bodies to continue functioning. And so if we can expand our understanding or our, um, our closed mindedness to seeing that everything is just a vibrating sum of the universe, and an expression of our imaginations. Mm. I, I like to think of this one as the wall socket. Mm. The energy is there, it's ready. All you need to do is plug something into it. Mm. And energy is absolutely everywhere. One of the uh, things about uh, a man named Tesla that he was able to tap into that and he devised a way apparently of drawing energy from what was considered to be thin air mm -hmm. you know, that he understood this principle mm -hmm. and was able to design and choreograph certain things that would help connect to that energy right. you know? Well, we can do that for ourselves. The energy we need and use in our everyday life is, it sometimes feels like it's endless, but we have to manage it effectively because, as I said, if we've got the socket on the wall that's ready to deliver energy to us, we also have to be mindful of how much energy do we need and are we going to overuse that circuit where it burns out or blows up. Mm. Like we can sometimes burn out. Or blow get, up. <laughs> or blow up <laughs> and become exhausted. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think that perhaps you're getting a sense now, if you're listening to this teaching, that we're only just touching the surface of these energies uh, simply because we have a time limit on this teaching today. 
but there are places where we can go into a lot more detail because these energies do open up and speak to many different arenas of study and exploration in our world. And so with that, we move to the 10th power. And this is where we find the sacred measure of intellect. All current potential or possible states of mental awareness. Moving from the conscious to the unconscious to the subconscious and back again. Mm. Also includes sanity and insanity. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all feel a little insane sometimes. <laughs> mm, absolutely. And that's when we struggle to make sense of things. Uh, I often catch myself saying, uh, if, if something doesn't make sense to me, I'll say, am I going crazy? <laughs> and so I feel like I'm on that side of the spectrum of edging towards insanity. Mm -hmm. But it, it is uh, the place where we can understand more about what our consciousness is about and that it isn't just fixed in one particular way. You know, we get very caught up in our conscious reality and what our conscious mind is telling us. And we don't often pay attention to the other levels of consciousness that are more subtle mm. and yet are present. You know, we do have access to our subconscious mind where we uh, can imagine things. We, we see things in pictures and um, we tap into a part of our creativity there a part of a deeper understanding of reality that is more spoken through the concept of metaphors mm. versus the conscious mind, which likes to speak through words and concepts and ideas. Which can be a little um, limiting when we look at the word intellect, especially yes. in the way in which we use it in our lifestyles today yeah. about intelligence. And this tenness, this this energy of sacred measure of intellect, uh, surpasses more than just that uh, mental intelligence that we tend to be um, uh, um, uh, plauded by uh, for when we can regurgitate information. This intellect speaks to many different ways in which our intelligence emerges. Yes. Lovely. So. We move into what we call now the Nagual powers of the 20 counts. And we're going to go a little faster with these energies, uh, simply for our timing. But they're also energies that can be a little bit more challenging to touch. So we begin, you can begin this time. Okay. We begin with grandfather stars. And although our sun is also something that's hard to touch, it is a part of our. Uh, everyday reality and the stars are something that links us to a much more distant uh, experience of energy in fact there are stars in our night sky that don't exist anymore that we're just waiting for the light the the extinguishing of that light to reach us <laughs> so it that, always boggles my mind I when i think about that <laughs> so in, in as a metaphor, the grandfather stars connect us to memory, to remember first that we are made of the same elements as the stars are made, that uh, everything is made from those same elements that exist. And, and that we have the ability to recall that information or that uh, stardust inside of us. Hmm. Twelve. Grandmother planets. The words here that you want to connect to are actualized memory. This is a link to what you were speaking about earlier in the ancestors, where we have past lives, where we've had previous experiences, and within those experiences are encoded the gifts, the talents, and the abilities uh, that we carried in those lifetimes. So actualized memory is when we can tap into that cellular memory within us and activate 
a skill or a talent that we never even trained for. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a common experience that people have where they'll say, wow, I've never done that before, but I really did it so well. Well, that's what this energy is about, is to, is to take us beyond just this one physical lifetime and link us into all of our experiences mm -hmm. from other lives. And also to recognize that perhaps if we think that we're the only humans uh, alive or, or living creatures alive on this planet, that, that uh, is a little self-important to think that there aren't other uh, forms of life out there on other planets as mm. well. We look to the south and this is where we find the 13. This is Earth Mother. Mm. Earth Mother is the energy within the plants themselves. So in those first 10 um, energies that we spoke about leading up to this wheel, uh, we're speaking about the physical world, the tonal world, as we call it. In these next 10 energies, we're speaking more from uh, an ethereal, spiritual energetic that resides within this tonal world, but isn't tangible in the same way. So here, when we're looking at Earth Mother, we're talking about the essence inside of the plant. That if I'm going to eat the broccoli, I can connect to its physical substance and gain something from it. But there is more energy inside of that than just the substance of the broccoli. Mm -hmm. That there is an energy within it that can feed me on different levels. So when we connect to that spirit of the plants, we're also connecting to that drive and that desire to keep growing. Mm. You know, we all have that inside of us. And it's an undeniable feeling, that reaching for the light like the plants do. Right, mm. yes. And it's a similar energy where we find 14 up here uh, in the north, where we speak about Earth Father because this is the spirit of the animals. Mm. Go on. <laughs> well, as you were saying about that intangible part of us and our connection to the plants, so it is this intangible energy that connects us to the animals. And this energy teaches us how to, uh, how to be in flow, how to find more happiness, more health, more harmony, more humor in our lives. The spirit of the plants teaches us um, so many gifts and things. In fact, there's a whole uh, paradigm called the African Medicine Wheel Astrology, where we look at the essence of the, uh, the, uh, the energy of the animals uh, so that we can call them into our awareness and we can walk with them and their gifts, their giveaways. Mm. We move to 15. This is where we connect to the souls of all humans. We could also say that this is like connecting in or plugging into the universal mind. Hmm. It's like the matrix here, <laughs> that our consciousnesses, to use that as a plural, uh, within humanity are all linked. We're all plugged into each other. It's just we have to tune into the frequency to receive uh, what is being communicated and shared. Hmm. And we do that often and regularly that it's not done consciously for the most part and so here if we can acknowledge that we are connected and linked uh, you could say telepathically as as one way of describing it then we can do it more consciously and pay more attention to those subtle messages that we get from each other yes. yeah I think this also speaks to what many people feel called to become healers is where uh, they feel like they want to give back to other humans. And instead of trying to be misguided and trying to heal another human, uh, being able to connect into these subtle energies of that morphogenetic field of humans is a, a far more productive way of connecting in. Mm -hmm. We look now to the southeast, and this is where we find the 16, the Akalodahe. We understand these energies to be the enlightened ones. Mm. Within our nature, we seek to better ourselves, to grow, 
to understand more, to, uh, to feel more. Uh, we do that in so many different ways. And one of the elements there is also empathy. Mm. Uh, as we learn, as we experience through uh, a, lot of, a lot of things that aren't really considered uh, joyful or pleasurable experiences, more our pain and our suffering. Uh, as we come through those, we come with greater gains and understanding of the challenge we have as human beings. And so when we look here at the Akalodahe, we're looking to, uh, to rise and expand our consciousness to accept that everything that happens is a powerful teacher. And the more we can accept that, the more we can drop the burden and find that journey of enlightenment, which is really letting go of our attachments mm. that keep us stuck in pain and suffering. And to allow the pain and suffering to be the teacher, knowing we're not going to escape it. It feels so simple. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we look to the southwest, and this is where we find the Kachinahe. So at the seven, where we found the, the sacred dream, here the Kachinahe are known as the dream teachers. And they can often represent um, to us something that we're working with or something that we're looking at. So a dream teacher may be something that presents itself to you in a dream, mm -hmm. like a snake and what your relationship is with the snake and what is being shown to you about the snake. That could be a representation of one of these, uh, these symbols of the dream. Mm. Yeah, this energy here is all about symbology and metaphor. Mm. You know, you spoke about having a dream of a snake. And for one person, dreaming of a snake might feel terrifying. And for another person, it might be uh, uh, invigorating. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's not about having our own interpretation of it but, uh, and, and, and imposing it on someone else. It's about finding our own interpretation and using it in our own lives. Uh, we often think that uh, because we understand something, everyone else has to see it the same way. So here, the Kachinahe are teaching us to pay attention to the symbology of life, all the various things that come across our path, and to find our own understanding of that. The more we understand that, the more we can uh, create the change that we want in our lives, or the more we can start to manifest the things we have that we want to have in our lives. Nice. We look to the northwest where we find the Shula Madahe. I know this is quite a mouthful, Shula Madahe. But these words are uh, heart sounds and they do connect us beyond what we think we need to understand. Remember, as I said to you in the beginning, that. Uh, the one way to learn these powers is to ask them directly to be our teachers. And so here the Shula Madahe are what, is, what are known as the magical teachers. They are the keepers of the book of life. And they are the guides that we can call upon to help us to negotiate and navigate those patterns that we come to realize are no longer serving us. Mm -hmm. And help us to look through that to find a more productive way mm -hmm. or a more efficient way or a more uh, supportive way. Yeah. I, I like uh, to look at this from the magical perspective, mm. because one thing I, I find fascinating about patterns is how magical it is to be able to change a pattern. That from one moment to the next, I can switch and no longer be stuck in a pattern. And, and that can feel like a magical transformation. You know, how often have you seen somebody and they come up to you and they haven't seen you in a while and go, wow, you've really changed. How did you do that? You know, <laughs> Because it seems like a mystery or a magical thing that you did. Because I called on my Shula Madahe to help. <laughs> All right, let's move to the Northeast, the 19, the Hokshidahe. The Hokshidahe is what we know to be our higher self, that breath of life, that whisper in our ear that says, yes, you can do it. Change needs to happen. All you need to do is take the next step. 
Although sometimes that can be very scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it might say change needs to happen or change is going to happen anyway. Right. So catch up to it. Yes. <laughs> I think that's more of the truth here. Uh, the the other thing about the Hochidahe is that um, it doesn't get caught up in stress or resistance or worry. Mm. It its uh, intention is to help us see beyond that, to accept that that's going to happen anyway, but to get on with it. Mm -hmm. You know, as uh, my teacher used to say, "Bitch, moan and complain all you want about." But do it anyway. <laughs> and I think that's what the Hochita would like to whisper in all our ears and get us to do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. And we move to the final power. And this is the 20. The Wakan Tonka. You may have heard this word being used many times, especially within shamanic circles, about the great spirit. The all that is, the all that was the all that ever shall be. Mm. Uh, this is the energy of the God, the Goddess. It is the energy of the great mystery that we began this teaching with and that we come around full circle to end the teaching with. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I hope. And so we just show you this image where all these energies and powers are present on the wheel from the one all the way through to the 20. And we bring this teaching to its completion, as usual, with a personal ceremony. And this personal ceremony is what we call a mesa working. And for some of you, you may not know the word mesa, but it really just means a table of power or an altar, a space where you can create a focus of intention. And so although we, um, we uh, had to move through this teaching fairly quickly, I think you can have an understanding of just how huge it can be. And so here this Mesa working opens the door for you to be able to create a space that you can work with these powers of creation but also that you can look for guidance in how to bring an aspect of your personality out that was perhaps repressed. Or perhaps you're finding that you're coming up against a specific fear or a concern around uh, financial abundance. Uh, whatever your intent is, that you can create this mess of working with. And you can take these uh, sigils, these numbers, these energies, these powers, and you can go and collect little pebbles, little stones, and you can draw the energy onto each of these stones as a, a way of connecting into them and represent these stones by laying them out around your mesa. So there's a couple of uh, examples there or suggestions that you can use to do a mesa working. It's a different way of praying and also a way of creating an intention to work with that you don't always have to sit and pay attention to. And so we wish you happiness in your song of the universe and the way in which you can uh, open up the doorways, the portals to all these powers and embody them within you. Oh. Oh. <laughs>